Hello, hello, we are live. Uh, welcome. Awesome. Hi, everyone. My name is Katherine Lawrence. I am a professional organizer. Um, technically, I am a certified professional organizer uh, and also a certified Kanmari consultant. And I've been working in this business uh, almost 20 years. And so uh, I talk about a couple of things on my channel. I've got some downsizing videos. Uh, I'm now doing quite a bit of work for uh, A&E Hoarders. So I've got some videos uh, up on my channel now, with kind of some watch with me parties, but I'll, I'll be doing some more content about that uh, coming up as well. And, uh, but honestly, one of the main things I love talking about is, is just working as a professional organizer. And I get a lot of questions about the behind the scenes of working as an organizer, uh, marketing, launching uh, businesses, all of all of these things do with organizing. So I've started doing these live streams. I've been doing them for quite a while now, and it's a it's a QA. So I've got a couple of questions that have already come in. I actually have a lot of questions <laughs> that I've actually already gotten over email. So thank you guys so much for that. So I'm going to start with some email questions that I've gotten. And uh, let me just pop over real quick to YouTube Live, just to make sure you guys can actually hear and see me. <clears throat> it's always nice to know if this is actually working. Okay, cool. I think uh, I see a couple of you guys over on um, YouTube. So when you come in the chat, let me know where you're from. How you doing today? Uh, it's springtime. It's organizing time, which is exciting uh, around here. So uh, let me know when you come in. And I'm going to go ahead and get started with the questions. You know, like I said, I've got quite a few today. And um, uh, I'm going to jump into those. And then as you guys join, please uh, ask your question. If you're watching the replay, just type replay and ask your question. I think I'm still getting those. Um, I wonder if you guys can hear me okay. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm still getting those even after the... Um, uh, let me just type in here. Can you guys hear me? some reason my little mic has oh there it is okay it went like red for a minute so I was like okay um but it's green now so hopefully you guys are hearing me okay and let me just give that a minute oh hello Laura yes awesome I have your question on my list thank you for checking in so I know that people can actually hear me because that's always my concern when I start doing this like can you actually hear me um, yeah, actually, Laura, since you're here, I'm going to go ahead and start with your question. And I don't know if you guys can tell, but today I have kind of a new um, setup for my Q&A live. So um, you should be able to see comments over here <laughs> on, oh my God, where are they? They're on uh, that side. God, it's so weird. Everything's backwards. So the comments will come up there and I can kind of highlight things. I'm going to try to share a screen. Let's see if I can do that. Um, thank you guys for letting me test out some new technology here. Um, yep. Let me see if I can. If not, I'll just read it off the. Uh oh, I think some weird tech thing is disabled. So never mind. I'm just going to read Laura. I'm going to read your question here. Okay, so Laura is our 20-year-old college student, uh, which is awesome that you're already thinking about being an entrepreneur and, and getting into the business of organizing or any business at all. Um, so you've been offering some organizing uh, to relatives for free and kind of taking pictures of before and after. And uh, Laura's question is, could I just offer my services as an individual without establishing a business name or Instagram account and things like that and if so you know how would I advertise um, and Laura does not have a Facebook or a personal Instagram account at the moment and she's wondering if it's better to start with a business name and and all of that for marketing purposes so people will take her seriously and you guys that that is a, a 
big part. There, there's a couple of great reasons to actually start a legit business. And uh, one of them is liability. You know, we want to make sure that our businesses are insured and that we are set up as a legit business because we're going into people's houses and we're moving stuff around. And, you know, we want to be uh, protected in, in all the things that we're doing in that regard. Um, I do, I really truly do think that having an established or a legit business, and what I mean by that is, you know, possibly being incorporated. I am an LLC. And, uh, you know, having a website and a business card and, you know, all those legitimate things. Um, also, you don't want to get in trouble with the tax man. You know, you want to make sure that if you're collecting money for a service that you're paying those taxes. And so um, I do think you should set it up. Well, let me back up because I know you're 20 and you're in college. So um, I'll kind of circle back to that. Um, but yes, in general, my, my advice is set up a legit business. One, you are protected. Two, you're going to get into less sort of, you know, legal and accounting type trouble. And um, also the, the big thing and, and what you mentioned, Laura, in your question was people taking you seriously. And I 100 percent think that having a, a credible and legit business allows our customers to take us seriously and shows that you know, we, we are in this to provide a service. You know, we didn't just wake up one day and thought, oh, I'm really good at organizing. Let me go work in some closets and maybe in a couple of weeks I'll be doing a different thing. Um, I do think credibility is really important in, in this business. You know, it's still a bit of a, a niche industry or a cottage industry. There's not um, tons of people, you know, in this business yet, though it is gaining popularity. Um, really quite a bit since Marie Kondo kind of came out with her best-selling books. It has gained uh, popularity outside of the United States as well. So, uh, so yes, for many reasons, I do recommend that you uh, get a legit business and start marketing your business. Now, with that said, I know you are still a college student and on the younger side and you know, I don't know how big the industry is, you know, where you live. So if you're still getting through college and you want to start establishing your credibility, and honestly, this is kind of true for, you know, there, there's also people older who are still working full-time jobs and they want to start establishing their credibility in the organizing business so that, you know, when they make that transition, they'll have some clients. Okay, so here's what I would, would highly recommend that you do is start a blog and and or but I'd probably do both and an Instagram account dedicated just to your organizing efforts. So what that is going to do and you want to start that as soon as possible. Um, you guys could even get those started like this week, really, you know, just setting up Instagram is really quick and easy to set up. Um, but you want it dedicated towards your organizing efforts. So you're going to have a post about um, organizing specific things, you know, kitchens, closets, you can talk about organizing products. And what this is going to do with your blog and your Instagram is it's going to create this history of you talking about this specific topic. So you're going to be doing this for years, really, but you're going to start kind of establishing that you have been talking about organizing for three months, for six months, that you've done, you know, 20 blog posts on organizing and, and different categories of things. So you are actually establishing yourself as someone who's credible to talk about this, but it's completely in your hands to, to get those things set up. So Laura, I would do that like now. Um, and, and even those of you guys who are, you know, maybe working full-time jobs, I, I would start that if you're not quite ready to like, go to your lawyer in an LLC and, and start doing all those things. I would start with a blog and a um, Instagram. Of course, when you post on Instagram, you're also going to post those over to Facebook. So you may as well set that up as well. But get people aware of what you're doing. Um, and actually, I've got another question that will kind of piggyback on this from um, another, actually, a young woman who lives outside the U.S. So I'll kind of come back to that. Um, let me check the comments here. Okay, we've got 
Uh, thank you for going live. You're welcome. It's like my favorite thing to do. <laughs> uh, I've been traveling quite a bit um, with uh, hoarders. And so that's why you guys probably have not seen a lot of scripted videos on my um, channel. But I will get back to that once I'm in town. But I love going live because I just, if I'm here in my office, I can turn on the camera and start talking to you guys. Um, let's see. We've got Allie from Michigan. Ah! <laughs> Sounds like she has her first consultation tomorrow your first client yeah um who take a deep breath <laughs> relax um yeah what does this process look like i would go to a video on my channel called um giving paid consultations or why organizers should give paid consultations and i'm going to talk a, a lot about the sort of process in that. Um, but I like doing the consultation first. You're gonna take a tour of the home. You are going to maybe take some pictures, some measurements, and I like to do a Trello action plan. Now, now you might not be able to figure out all of that for tomorrow, um, but you definitely wanna put some type of plan in place to provide that to the client. Because that basically is you know part of what you can pay for that service. So, um, yeah, if, if you're just trying to get through tomorrow, I would, I would take a notebook and take a tour and take pictures and just talk about all the wonderful things you can do to help them organize their house and then give, provide those notes to them and, and kind of talk about the big picture and then try to book that first job before you leave. You know, you're going to be going into the bedroom and the closet and the basement and the attic and the garage and all these places and you know, try to figure out what their priority is. You know, if they, if their kitchen is sort of a high priority, focus on that and then immediately try to book that job to start in the kitchen. So that's how I would do it. Um, awesome. Great. I see a couple of more people joining us here and let me pull up my next question. Um, this is actually from Anna and she's in Croatia. And I think Laura, you, you may, um, may kind of connect with her as well. She's in her twenties and she is saying that after contacting a few people from my family and friends in order to organize their garages, closets, cluttered areas, she keeps getting the same answer. And they say that they are feeling uncomfortable for somebody to look at and touch their personal belongings. And her biggest worry is that um, she's not sure how she's going to break into this mindset and convince people to trust her. Um, now, she's saying this mindset is is um, sort of in her area of Croatia. I have to say, I've encountered a lot of people with that same mindset. You know, I live in the U.S. I live in uh, Virginia, which is in the South. Um, I also live in a very sort of farming kind of blue collar area. So there's a lot of kind of distrust and and confusion over, you know, what someone like me would do to, you know, come into someone's house. And yeah, I mean, a couple of things I would try, um, just like we were talking with Laura, you can use social media to establish your credibility. So you want to blog or do Instagram, but establish something that people can kind of check you out without you directly saying to them, hey, I'm really great at what I do. So um, like for me, you know, if I'm meeting a total stranger and they don't know that, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years or that I'm on a television show or that I have a YouTube channel and they're just meeting me off the street, they're probably not going to trust me. They're going to say, what are, you, what are you talking about? You know, you've got this business. I don't even understand what you do. I, would, I wouldn't trust you. So you do have to establish trust with anyone um, before they will hire you to go through their very you know personal items so a couple of ways to do that um, when you are sending material to these uh, potential clients I want you to you know look as legit as possible you know a nice formal email or something but I want you to share with them a confidentiality policy so uh, here in where I am, I'm a member of NAPO and they have a whole code of ethics that I have you know, pledged to um, 
adhere to. And so I actually include that in my client agreement that, you know, here's the code of ethics. This is, you know, what I'm, uh, um, you know, going to keep, I don't know, ad adhere, I guess that's the right word. But, um, and then I also put a confidentiality agreement, I think additionally in that. And if you guys are um, in my essential forms course, you'll get my exact uh, client agreement. So you'll see what I'm talking about and referring to that confidentiality piece. Um, but if you're not a member of a trade association, you can certainly just come up with some language around uh, this confidentiality pledge that you have with your client. So uh, recently I went to work for a woman who was in her 80s and she had a family member who had hoarded, you know, different parts of her house and she definitely needed someone to come in and, and help her, you know, clear out and get organized. And she was really on the fence about it. Um, she just, you know, I don't know what, you know, what this is about, but I sent her an email and it had my client agreement and it had, um, I, I think I included as a separate attachment, like the code of ethics and talked about confidentiality. And she did book me to do that job. So she was, she was very worried about the confidentiality piece. So you want to, um, you know, put them at ease about that. And then also if you're in a community you know, like uh, Anna was saying in this community in Croatia, that she's, people just don't have that mindset of letting someone in, and maybe they're a little bit more guarded. I would also highly recommend, and this is going to work for a lot of you guys too, to go into your community and give free workshops. So I have done these um, in the beginning. I did these a lot at charity thrift stores, um, at uh, libraries libraries, get out in your community and start talking to them because anytime you sort of have that platform, you're going, people are going to see you as an expert. And I'm really curious too, um, Anna, in your community, what the biggest sort of pain point is. Like what are people going to hire you to do? Is it helping them unpack or move or downsize or is it new families? Like get to know your audience really well and figure out kind of what their um, what their greatest need is. And then I would do some free training and workshops in your community. And like, let's say their greatest need is, you know, seniors downsizing so that the next generation doesn't inherit, you know, all of this clutter and junk. I would put together a little workshop and give that in my community and see if you can kind of connect there. So um, that will establish your credibility. People can ask you questions and then that's going to kind of get their wheels spinning. Like, hmm, maybe I do actually need, you know, this service in my life. Um, but really try to connect with your community and, um, and make sure that you have a confidentiality agreement that you can share with them. Okay, let me back up here. Oh my gosh, so many questions. Okay, so Allie's coming in here. She's saying, wonder about products. Should I bring some with me? What if I need some while I'm organizing? Okay, Allie, I've got a video. Just go to my YouTube channel and type in container and pull up. I did a whole video on why I don't bring containers with me or keep them in stock. Uh, personally, for me, it's just, it's, a little too much to keep up with sort of having a supply of shoe boxes and photo boxes and different things that I may or may not need. Um, so I like to do the consultation first. And then I'm going to during that consultation, I'm going to put together like some rec a recommended sort of product shopping list. And then I'm going to kind of share links with that client. So they know like, okay, I think you're going to need you know, photo boxes for this job coming up. But I really, as a general philosophy, and I talk about this in the container video, that's always sort of the last step for me is purchasing the containers because I'm going to be moving things around. And so I kind of want to declutter first. Um, I'm sure you guys have talk, heard me talk about GDP with the put away when you have the containers. So, um, you know, I might bring some Ziploc bags and some paper bags, but honestly, a lot of my clients have too many organizing products in their home. So I can always find like, and they shop a lot, unfortunately, which is sometimes how people become very cluttered is too much shopping. 
So they already have shoe boxes, Amazon boxes, totes and tubs and uh, all of those things. So you should have some product at the house already if they've attempted to get organized. Um, but yeah, I would just stage things in different areas and then get my product later. Otherwise, you're going to get the wrong product. It's not going to fit. Hopefully you're downsizing them anyway, so you might not need the product. And then they already have so many products. So yeah, try to save that to the end if you um, if you can. All right, if traveling out of town, this is from Dawn, should I charge mileage, federal rate, uh, and time in both directions? Yeah, you guys can do this a number of ways. Um, I've done it a few ways. I've never, I've never really, unless I'm maybe contracting for someone, I don't, I don't usually give the client that like to the penny mileage. I may just say, hey, you're outside of my area, I'm going to charge a $35 travel fee or $50 or whatever it is. So you can just have kind of a blanket fee. Um, sometimes, or what I used to do in the beginning, I'd say, I'm just going to charge you a day rate. So I'm only going to do a job that I have to travel to if you're booking me the whole day. And they just know they're going to get sometimes a little bit less time if I'm on the road for two hours during that eight hour uh, day. So, um, and actually I have a friend right now, she's an organizer and she is working. I can't even believe she does this, but she drives like two hours to a job, um, which for me is just, it's just too much. I wouldn't have any energy left if I commuted that long, but she just starts the clock on her rate when she gets in the car. So the client is paying for those two hours, um, I guess both ways. So four hours of time, um, so, so yeah, you can charge an extra hour, you can do a day rate, you can just charge a flat fee, uh, anything should work. But if you want to work outside your market, definitely have some kind of fee. Uh, all right, I'm going to hop over to some questions that had can't come in because they're, I think they're pretty short here. Um, so Alika ask or Elika, I got to find out which way to pronounce your name. Um, maybe Elika has a friend with a whole room full of books everywhere. And in, to, in, or, in order to organize them, she's asking me would I first remove all the books and then kind of sort by category and put them back? Um, or would I just go through kind of one at a time to decide what to get rid of? Um, or organize the books first and then make decisions in those categories? Yeah, I mean, if... I always, first of all, yes, always take all the books off of the bookshelf. Uh, I've certainly had clients who have, you know, 20, 30 bookcases, and we're not even going to do all of that in one session. Um, but I do think it's a little easier to always think of things in categories. So, for example, um, uh, cookbooks. You know, I may try to pull all the cookbooks together and then say, hey, can you pick your favorite cookbooks? And and sort of allow space for that. Um, I have gotten pretty detailed in the past. You know, if the client wants it, I'll you know separate fiction, historical fiction, biographies, nonfiction. You know, you can get really detailed. Um, I've only really done that if the client requested that the books are organized that way when we're putting them back. Like if they want fiction in one room and you know cookbooks in another room and historical uh, books in another place. So I have gotten pretty detailed with it. Um, but I think for that first pass of decision making, I'd, I'd probably be kind of high level of like a keep and toss or put everything together in a category to uh, find out what they want to keep. Because as you guys know, this is a lot of this is about decluttering. Um, the more you declutter, the less you have to organize. So whatever you can do to um, to make that process more streamlined. Oh, here's, here's Aurora, our 14 year old. Oh, how oh, could I start a business now? Yeah, I think I would give you the same advice as Laura as the college student. I mean, I don't know what the ages are. Check with your parents. I think Facebook's 13. I don't know. Um, but find out if you can, you know, with your parents permission, get an Instagram or Facebook to start publishing, you know, your, your thoughts on organizing. Um, yeah, so blogging is like a whole world. Um, I'll share with you guys, you know, when I started 
as an organizer and setting up my service business, I had paying clients within a couple of months. And I think it took me maybe 18 months to get back to my like corporate income that I had at my, you know, full time corporate job. But I had paying clients, you know, I had income within that first year. A couple of years ago, I started in the blogging world. And I have to say, I feel like it's it's taking so much time to really turn it into a profit um, that I, I feel like it's almost years, whereas the service business, I got that up and running pretty quickly. But if you're 14 or 20 and you're still in school and you're trying to figure things out, absolutely start blogging now. There are a million uh, online schools that will teach you about blogging or creating YouTube channels, you know, all of those things. So, you know, just start with a basic website, start putting your thoughts out there. And I would just start with the content, you know, take a picture of an organized space and write a paragraph about it and post it, you know, on Instagram and kind of stick with that content. So that's sort of a little bit of like baby blogging with um, Instagram, but then you can certainly have a website and write more of, I mean, just like when you're in school and you're writing an essay, you're just going to write an essay about organizing a kitchen or, you know, toys or, you know, anything. It's, it's kind of that same thing, but just get in the habit of writing and posting pictures and, um, and, and you'll be on your way. You're welcome, Opal. Um, I'm not sure I understand this question. So let me read it out. Um, I run life. So I've been setting up my business service agreement, etc. However, I'm missing the actual organizing process. Yeah, um, you might want to check out um, my I'll put a link in the description. Let me see if I can quickly pull it up. But my intro course um, I've got the intro course right now with the um, kind of a bonus to get the um, the blueprint workbook. Uh, I don't know if I have that link here, but um, I'll give you the link for the intro course. And then if, if you take that, just let me know and I'll include that workbook. Uh, I think I can add it later. Um but yeah, I ha so I have this, um, I'm just going to put it in the chat box here, um, an introduction course, and that's really going to talk about the process of organizing. So um, that's going to talk about, um, you know, everything from the first time a, a client like picks up the phone or e sends you an email, what you do in that step, which is uh, I like to book a call, you know, consultation. And then I do like an in-home consultation or an action plan. And then I break the project down and then charge them for sessions. And then in the session, we're doing what's called GDP, which is the gather and sort, the decision making and the put away. So that's about a one minute version of like a two hour course. Um, but that's the course to really actually explain the process, your client process. So if you are... Um, feel like you don't quite have that in in place that's the course for you and um, I developed that course to just kind of give you the confidence to go and work a paid organizing job so um, it's it's pretty it's basic but it tells you what you need to know in order to you know do this as a paid uh, to actually charge a client and what you're going to charge them for so I hope that helps and I'm going to pop over here. Um, Jennifer had a quick question that she sent me today about reaching out to real estate agents and if she should have them sign a paid partnership and how can she pay them for referrals? Um, so Jennifer, the only partnerships I've had where I pay someone else or they're sort of like money exchange is other organizers. Um, and you can do that a couple of ways. Um, which is either, you know, kind of a referral fee for someone giving you jobs or they can hire you as a contract to do a job. So if there's an organizer in my area and she's got too much work that she, you know, can't handle everything, she can actually hire me 
to do that job. And so she's going to uh, be receiving the money from the client. So she's going to get paid for her marketing and her time doing any scheduling and, and all of that. And then um, she's going to hire me for the hours that I work with the client. So that's that's one way you can do a partnership. Um, I really haven't, as far as like real estate agents and closet installers and junk haulers, I do a lot of business referral. I haven't put together a paid agreement. I don't know if, if any of you guys have, you know, in this chat, let me know. Um, I haven't done it as, you know, a, a written contract. Um, usually, what I'm trying to do is give business to that person and then we can get into a relationship where I'm giving them business and they're giving me business. So, um, and particularly with real estate agents, um, certainly clients have asked me who are moving. I mean, I actually get this question all the time. So I probably should have a closer relationship with a real estate agent, um, but who I recommend, you know, so I would just think of that referral as a two way street. And then I like to, something that I have done with real estate agents is done like content for them or like tips and workshops and that type of thing. So you can kind of pay them back as being sort of an, an expert for their clients. So um, that this is when they put information about you in like a newsletter or on their blog or their social media. So, you know, if a real estate agent has like an Instagram account and then you can give them like top three tips for unpacking your house in an organized way. So you give that to the real estate agent. They share that with their clients. And so, you know, it's kind of a sort of information sharing type relationship. So that's how I've done it. I haven't done the, the like payout um, way, but you could certainly try that and, and let me know how it goes. Uh, where am I with our comments here? Oh, no, I, I need to hurry up. There's a lot coming in. Um, let's see. Yes. Yeah. Um, do you purge and categorize one day and then buy stuff the other day? I've done that quite a bit, especially with kitchens. I will come in one day because there's so much stuff and the pantry items and the expired foods and all the spices. I will come in one day. Or, um, yeah, I usually do a full day with kitchens um, and I, you know, go through everything, downsize and I kind of stage it the way I want it. And then I will order the products before I leave. And then it doesn't always work. I usually have things delivered, so I don't necessarily come back the next day, but I'll come back in a couple of days and put the products in. So, yes, um, it's a lot when you're decluttering to put the products in at the same time. Um, wanna, I, I, Certainly many times I've had the session, with the decluttering and decision making, and then I'll and then I'll order the products and then I come back. Yeah. Um ba -ba -ba, how do you guarantee the client that you will that what you do will not last for only one week and you engage the family pro Yeah. Okay, guys. So this is a question about maintaining. And I do not guarantee that that they can maintain the system because it's a hundred percent up to them. And you will find, especially if you guys start to work with some people who are like shopaholics or have um, like to buy stuff. This if like if I organize a closet and it's beautiful and I leave and then that weekend they buy a hundred new shirts, dresses, coats, which has happened by the way. And then I come in two weeks later and they're like, wow, my closet's really messy and nothing fits. It's like, well, you doubled what you have in the closet. So um, I certainly am very aware and, and I'm, I'm constantly teaching my clients behavior shifts and I try to gosh, even from that first phone call with the client to identify some of the behavior changes and, and habit changes that really need to happen in order for them to be organized. Um, it's usually around shopping and sentimentality and just kind of general, sometimes some wellness is in there as well. So uh, it's a process. I am going to be teaching them a number of things um, but as far as maintaining that order, you know, I'm going to give them as many skills as possible, but 
you know, if they don't put things back, you know, if they take that out and then don't put them back in the home that's labeled with the container, uh, it's going to get messy again. And, and, and don't feel that that's really your fault um, because, you know, they still have to use the system and put things back and not buy more things. And so. That's funny because I haven't had a client say, do you guarantee this is never going to be disorganized again? That no one's really ever asked me that. <laughs> so, um, so um, Katura maybe? Um, when setting up organizing businesses with uh, legal Zoom, what industry does it fall under? Oh, uh, you know, guys, this is kind of ongoing issue that the professional organizing is, you know, when you go to get a, a license, insurance, it's, it's still a pretty small business. So this is a, a tough one. I would, I would definitely check with the, the legal advisors there or your lawyer or your attorney or your government agency. Um, generally, I am checking if home services, like a, as a very broad term, um, home services or a, a service, like sometimes it's personal service, like a service that you're providing directly to a, to a person. Um, but sometimes, you know, for insurance, it falls under interior decorating or cleaning. Um, I, in the past, sometimes I've had to use cleaning service just because it was the only way I could explain that I go into a person's house and I move things around and sometimes I throw things away and I'm kind of doing that. So it's a tough one. I, I really don't always, I kind of rarely see professional organizing as its own category in dealing with um, anything tax legal. So uh, just explain to the advisor, I, um, in my essentials, essential forms course, there is a startup discovery guide, which is like a bonus in there. And there is kind of a list of questions for like your accountant, your uh, lawyer, your government agency, and um, maybe through kind of getting, going through those questions. Oh, and actually this is, yeah, what type of insurance? Same thing. Uh, when you're looking at that guide, there's, um, it's kind of like questions that you would ask your insurance agent and questions that you should be prepared to uh, for them to ask you. There is uh, certainly a general liability um, protection that you're going to want to get, but it really depends on what you're doing after that. I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, some organizers install closet systems. So they're coming in, they're using power tools, they're making holes in walls. That is going to be a higher level of insurance than what I do, which is more like consultative in nature. And I do not use um, power tools. So you really want to actually let me put that link in here while I'm thinking about it. This is my most popular class is the essential forms and the if you're getting into like what to talk to with an attorney, with an account, with an insurance, you're going to want to, um, you're going to want to look over that discovery guide because, oh yeah, that's the key. I was like, why is this link so long? But it's a coupon code. Um, you're yeah. I think you would find that helpful because there's, there's a lot of people you're going to be talking to about, your business to or talking to about your business. And um, yeah, it's always a little bit of challenge for organizers. Let's see. Thank you guys for being so interactive today. I feel like I'm kind of meeting some new people. Uh, I recognize a couple of names, but I'm seeing some new names as well. So welcome. Um, yeah. Okay, Emily, <laughs> or Emmy, Emmy, Emily. Um, yeah, this is a question about choosing a business name. And after this live stream, um, I want you to go to my channel and just type in business name um, because I did a very detailed blog about this because there are quite a few things you want to consider. Um, 
for example, if you want to use your name, your personal name, it may be harder in the future to sell your business or expand your business if you are going to be your personal brand. Uh, my business is called Space Matters. And so when I had employees, you know, it wasn't any uh, trouble or now now that I have contractors, people can just write a check to Space Matters and, you know, it's not, they're not always under the assumption that Catherine is going to be the one providing organizing services. Um, so that's certainly something to consider. Um, honestly, these days, you really want to find the Instagram handle, uh, make sure, because that's a unique so you don't want to go through all the trouble of naming your business and doing all these things. And then you can't get the Instagram handle or the domain name. So you certainly want to consider that. Um, but I would absolutely, well, you can check out the video, um, but you might want to also read the blog. So if you, my website is myspacematters.com. Let me put that in here. I think it's on the screen. Did I put that up there? Um, and same thing in the blog, go to the search feature and just put in business name or, you know, naming your business. <clears throat> and I would read through that cause I kind of have like four different sort of choices of how you can do it. And, um, you can be really vague. Like Marie Kondo is it's Kanmari. Like her company is Kanmari incorporated. So clearly that is a, a made up name, which actually made it really easy to brand and get the domain name and the Instagram and all of that, because it's a sort of a new word that she came up with, which is a combination of her, um, uh, first and her last and first name. So that that's an example of just creating a completely new word. And then it is easier to find those handles where if you want to be called like simply organized, you know, you're going to there's going to be it's going to be harder to find those domain names and social media handles because that's a very popular common name. So do your research, find something that's unique and and, you know, talks about your own brand. I'm going to pop over here. Um, I had another question. Um, actually, I'm not sure. I, um, Anna, who is our our friend from Croatia, she also had a couple of other smaller questions, which I think I've heard from a lot of you guys as well. Um, her concern is also about education and what is the best course for getting certified in the business, in this business. So a lot of people ask me about the certification um, process and there's, there's a couple of certifications. Uh, mine is through uh, NAPO um, and I also have one through Marie Kondo, the Kanmari, um, certified Kanmari consultant. What you need to understand about certification is probably the number one thing to understand is that you work with clients and through that experience, you gain certification. So it's not like you just take a course and you're certified as a professional organizer. You may take many courses and then work with lots of clients and then you would qualify to sit for an exam to become certified. So with NAPO, it's like 1500 hours with clients, with some substitutions and um, when I did Kanmari, it was 30 hours. I don't know if they've changed that, but you have this, you know, work with clients and then get. So honestly, if you, I think the best thing to do starting out is to take a class, a very affordable, you know, hundred dollar course. I would love for you to take mine because I, I did make it to be very affordable. Um, and take a course that's going to give you the confidence to start taking clients because the best thing you can do, you know, for certification and for experience is to take clients. And I've said this before, you know, I love NAPO um, and they have great education, but sometimes when people get into NAPO, they think, oh, I have to take like all of these courses before I can start taking clients which is not the case. You want to try to um, book clients and get experience while you're taking some courses and then they kind of go hand in hand. So I don't want you guys to train 
for like a year and take all these courses and try to get all these certificates and then not have any clients. But you really need to just get out and work with clients. So um, yeah, you're going to be working towards your certification and then just take a few classes to get yourself prepared to, to take clients and take easier jobs. You know, the first job you take isn't going to be like extreme hoarder, you know, take some simple jobs, you know, a playroom or touch up a closet or, or maybe, you know, a kitchen, you know, not, don't just jump into like a whole home downsizing or something that's, that's a little, it's a little much. So, you know, just start with more simple, um, jobs and then, I'm still taking classes. I mean, after 20 years, like I still take training classes to learn some new things. So you don't really stop educating yourself, but you want enough training that you're comfortable and confident to take paid clients. And then you're going to continue to train, you know, as you work with people. Um, yeah. So as far as the best education, um, I think you're definitely looking at something long term, you know, you want to start with something and then continue. If you love the Marie Kondo method, and that's the type of organizing you want to practice, you can certainly, you know, go go that route. Um, there's so many different things you guys can do with organizing. I, I really, you know, you have to kind of focus on what you want to do. And then, you know, get an education that supports that. Um, but the best is on the job training <laughs> for sure. Okay, so Laura says, how can you organize closets in a way that adapts to the constant acquiring of clothing besides one in, one out? Uh, you most likely have to return and rethink the space. Yeah, I mean, you guys, and this is gonna be really common. I would say it's, it's almost it's probably my number one frustration. I have to think about that, but it's it's really high on the list that um, you're going to have clients who do not like to organize, but they're going to keep acquiring new things. So, you know, you could certainly, I mean, with kids, you kind of have to do it because they're growing so much. So you can, in your business, offer like a seasonal switch out or um, I would definitely do this if you're if you're working with moms and kids, you know, at the end of the school year and at the beginning of the new school year or over the holidays, you know, anytime that they're acquiring, you want to do a closet refresh. And honestly, you could probably build a whole business just on closet refreshes and then just book people um, two to four times a year to do their closets. So um, if, you, if that doesn't frustrate you, you know, too much, but I'm um, definitely with kids. If you're going to be working with kids, um, you're going to, you're going to want to redo those closets at least twice a year, I would say. So, you know, if that, it, for me, it sort of frustrates me if, if people are just buying nonstop, um, because it is harder to kind of keep control over it. Um, but, you know, if, if you don't mind working with that sort of high consumer, you're probably going to be able to book yourself several sessions a year just on closets. So get yourself, you know, 10 or 20 clients, and then you're going to repetitively go back to them like every season for closets. And then you can also just add in projects like pantry. Pantry is a good maintenance one. Um, <clears throat> paperwork. Paperwork's a good a continuing organizing um, if you don't mind doing that type of maintenance, which, you know, if you like that, that's um, can certainly be the bread and butter for your business is maintenance work. Um, okay, so let's see. So I answered a question. How do you deal with sending proposal if you don't know um, the total products? Yes. Um, and guess what, guys? I don't do proposals with all the products. I know. I know. Some organizers will teach you to do these big proposals. Um, I don't really teach that method. And there are several reasons for that. One, I think I would strongly, strongly advise if you are a new organizer, like you have had fewer than, say, five or ten paid clients, I would avoid proposals for now. 
Now, if you have a thriving business and you've worked with, you know, 50 clients, 100 clients, you know, you you're really going at this full time and you want to do the proposal method that that would make sense in the future. But boy, um, you know, in my coaching program, I, I actually really work individually with people to to kind of get out of that proposal mindset for those first few clients, because what happens is you go to the client's house. You do a walkthrough, you put together all these pieces, you think about all the products you could buy, and the next thing you know, you've worked five hours, eight hours, and you haven't gotten paid, and then the client might not hire you. So I don't want you guys to work that hard and not get paid. So, um, so yes, I would recommend that you do you know, an initial free phone call, but then you start you know, having services that you can charge right away, and then product shopping, will be part of that but it needs to be um with the time that you're getting paid so i hope that makes sense i've got um i know it's something i talk about a lot in fact i think i have a video specifically about not doing proposals so um you might want to watch that one because it's it's something i just strongly do not recommend for brand new organizers to try to put together those complicated proposals it, it's just that's not good um your blog or YouTube channel. Um, I mean, I would definitely check out uh, NAPO. I think they have a lot of, of public information. I don't know if they have to go to their website. I think they do have some public stuff. I think it depends on your sort of niche, like if you're going to be doing families or, or kind of product based. Um, I like the Kanmari Marie Kondo blog. I always get some inspiration from that. Yeah, I, I think it kind of depends on what you um, kind of what type of organizing you're going you're going to be practicing because there's there's a lot of there's just a lot of content out there. I know there's um, a lot of mom you know mom blogs, family organizing, productivity. I'm sure whatever you you your interest is, there's there's a ton out there. Uh, Let's see, we have a question about the KonMari method. Have you found that the KonMari method makes it easier for your clients to let go of stuff? Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of, of the KonMari method. I think I have to have a client who has like read the book or watched the show or taken the course because I find that a lot of people don't understand what KonMari is. Um, they think it's about just minimalism and like trying to let go of as much as possible, which is not what it's about. Um, now some people think it's about product and like fancy containers, which again is not what it's about. So I think if, if your client, and of course I'm going to help my client with this if they're interested in KonMari. Um, yeah, if they truly understand the sort of concept behind the method. And of course, my job is, is to be on site and to train them a little bit and teach them more about the method. Yeah, people get rid of tons of stuff. I mean, it just makes sense because it's like um, you just have to read their body language. And it's amazing how much stuff people have in their houses that they don't like. It's it's fascinating that there's so much stuff that people either there's like a negative attachment or they don't like the clothes that they're wearing or they, yeah. I mean, when you actually go through every individual item in someone's home and like they have to like, you know, pick it up and look at it and how does this make me feel like, I mean, if people really can get their brain around that, they will absolutely let go of stuff in, in groves. I mean, tons of stuff. All right, Emmy's going to be checking out. Um, yeah, guys, I think I have like 50 or 60 videos. And um, also all my videos have blogs attached to them. So sometimes you can get a little bit more from reading the blog because you can kind of see things in like bullet points. So uh, check out the blog as well. And then she's got one more question. Um, in your experience, you recommend sole proprietorship or LLC when registering your business. What makes the most sense when you haven't 
had a client yet. I mean, you know, if you haven't had a client at all, um, a lot of the business stuff is probably not going to make a lot of sense because it's um, it's kind of based on a lot of other factors like, um, you know, your income and um, if you're going to have employees and, you know, how you're going to kind of manage the the finances of your business. So um, a couple of resources. I'm going to put this in. Uh, if you guys have heard of SCORE, whoops, SCORE.org, uh, they do free uh, business mentoring. So that would be, probably be a great question to ask. And then, um, you know, when you're setting up your business, you really do need to talk to an accountant, a lawyer, you know, all those things. I think if I had zero clients, I mean, this is what I did. I went out in practice and then I started taking paid jobs and then I immediately went to an accountant and was like, I have money now. How am I going to claim that on my taxes? And so um, how your business is set up, you definitely want to talk to the accountant about, you know, how to, I like to make sure that I I'm, I'm very like, I like to follow the rules and make sure that I account for every single dollar, but I also want to pay the least amount of taxes that I can. So by setting up that legit business, any uh, business expenses that I have become a tax deduction. So um, I have a, a friend who, <clears throat> who I talk to and she has been setting up a blogging business, but she doesn't have an LLC or it, it's not... Um, you know, it's not set up as a, you know, quote unquote, legit business. So whenever she buys a training course or a software, she's paying out of pocket for those expenses. Um, <clears throat> but since I have, I personally have an LLC, but you could certainly do this with um, a sole proprietor. You want to make sure that when you're paying those expenses, that you're keeping track of those as a business. And it's not just, you know, it's going to offset the income that you have from, uh, hopefully all those paid clients that you're going to have very soon. So um, you definitely want to think of it in those terms of having a legit business. But, you know, honestly, what I would try to work on um, since you you don't have clients yet is just work towards getting those first like three paid clients and get some income. And then you can use that income to, you know, set up your business. So I would really focus on getting some paid clients, um, even if they're, they're probably just going to be friends and family, you know, at this point, but, but someone that will actually, you know, give you uh, money and start getting that income in your business and then make sure you're accounting for it, of course, properly. Um. Okay, so Laura says, I'd like my service to be affordable to all. Should I adopt my rates? depending on the size of space of stuff that there is to organize. You know, Laura, I mean, it's, this is a tough thing. I mean, I, I struggle with this and I, I've heard this a lot from my um, coaching students about pricing and making things affordable. Um, there's a couple of things I would recommend to you. You know, you really have to establish your price based on your business expenses and the income that you need. I mean, you need income to, I know I have a car and a mortgage and, you know, all of those wonderful things like food and electricity that you have to pay for. So you really, you need to establish a business that can support, um, you know, an income for yourself. And also your business is going to have expenses. You know, you need insurance. We've talked about some um, legal structure. So, you know, you you may need a couple of thousand dollars to run your business. And then you need, of course, your income that you need to put in your pocket. So you need to make sure you're accounting for those things and then looking at your pricing structure and making sure it supports you. Now, with that said, I, I am a very generous person. I want to give all the free advice I can you can do that from a YouTube channel. You can do that in your blog. You can give free workshops in your community. Um, you can do pro bono jobs. You know, I like to, to do a volunteer job. I used to do one before COVID. Uh, I used to do one once a quarter and I would go and do, um, you know, work a day for free and, and offer up my services. So 
as far as you know you really need a price that's going to be sustainable and then as far as just sort of helping everyone um you can find other ways to do that um i mean i don't really change my rates i i have uh, what i call a session rate i have a consultation rate i have a contractor rate if another organizer is hiring me but i i stay really consistent with what i'm charging the client because that's that's what i need to charge to keep my business open so you know figure out that rate and then um yeah you're gonna need to market out there in the community and find people that you know have the means to pay that rate and it's tough because if you start discounting your services you know let's say you you know you need 50 dollars an hour you know 25 hours a week in order to pay all of your bills and then you find a client who has a ton of stuff but they want to pay you 20 dollars an hour and the problem is if you start taking that job and then that client wants to hire you for all of your time you've you've basically cut your income in half and you may not be able to pay for you know your training your insurance and you know and just pay your bills and then you're gonna have to go out of business so you know just just keep that in mind that um you don't want to if you offer too many discounted services you know you you just want to keep the big picture in mind of what you need to actually live to keep your business open so just just think about that um i'm assuming you're <laughs> could you do a house tour yeah you know you know guys i have wanted to do a tour of well i do have a kitchen I have a kitchen video on my on my website. I feel like I've probably shown you all of my office because I put it up on social media. And um, the only issue I have with giving more house tours is the lighting. So my house is very like open and I have skylights. And whenever I try to videotape with all this natural lighting, it just, it's like grainy. I don't, I'm not actually a videographer or have like expensive equipment, so. Um, yeah, I, uh, I just got some photos done uh, by a professional photographer um, and she we went into some different rooms in my house and and I'm going to be posting those on my new website. So you'll see like I have a med actually my meditation room. You can see my meditation room on on YouTube. So you there's a few. Yeah, if you if you go deep into those videos, you'll see it. But um, yeah, I'm going to I'll try. Maybe if I get a better camera, I can I can do. Um, something better i i'm too i'm jealous too like when i watch these youtube channels and they have this like they must have these like three thousand dollar cameras or something and they're filming and you know they have like thousands of dollars of product in their closet and i'm also real like blue collar farm girl with my stuff like i shop at thrift stores and i love vintage stuff so i always am, am like a little jealous when i see other people's like house tours and they have like like a renovated kitchen, like everything's new and renovated. I'm like, my house is a little, you know, I mean, you guys know I live out on a farm and, you know, it's a little more weathered, but I think it could be, I think it's really beautiful. I love my house, but um, I have to try to find a better way to, to photograph it and film it. Um, yeah. Oh, prosy, Cool name. Um, how long should a, a home consultation last that first consultation? I like to say that I'm on site for about two hours and then I do like an action plan and sometimes that takes me another hour. Um, but usually 90 minutes to two hours, I can get the tour of the house. I can kind of type up some of the plan and um, and kind of get going. All right. Oh, it's three o'clock. I got to walk. I got to walk my dog. <laughs> let's, let's see. I got a few more questions here. Um, oh, actually, that's just thank you. You're welcome. Um, oh, thank you. Oh, and Lawrence, St. Lawrence. What a great name. Um, yeah, you guys, you're you're so welcome. Uh, let me look at my other. Did I hit all the other? I think I hit all the other questions that were sent in as well. Yeah, guys. So I um I've got a little traveling coming up for um again I'm working on any hoarders, which I have a couple of watch parties up on my channel now, 
and um, you guys can see me. I think the next episode you can see me on is maybe in, in two weeks, but if you're on my email list or the Facebook group, uh, which is organizing for professionals, you can find more information there. Um, so I'm trying to do as many lives and I, I really need to get back to the um, putting out content and, and blogs and videos for you guys. Um, it's just a little harder right now since we're actively um, filming on on hoarders. So I'm traveling a lot, but it's a ton of fun. And so I'm, I really... Um, hope that I can take a lot of those lessons. I'm going to be doing more videos of like how to break down like extreme cleaning type jobs. So um, I'll have I have more content about that. So way more videos to come. Um, so please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already and uh, get on my email list. I think a lot of you guys are already on that, but um, you can email me. Um, let me just put my email here. Um, info at MySpace Matters. And um, let me know when you when you go to my website, which is MySpaceMatters.com, you can get your free guide. Uh, I think I still have a link to that or there'll be a link in this video and that's how you get on my list. So I can keep you guys updated with everything else that's going on. So thank you so much for joining me and best of luck, you guys, in starting and launching your businesses. Bye.